Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar hosted by Rails to Trails Conservancy's Trail Expert Network. I'm Eli Griffin. I'm Manager of Trail Development Resources here at Rails to Trails Conservancy, and I'll be facilitating today's webinar. Our topic is trail network signage. We have four panelists on the line today, all of whom have been directly involved in creating or implementing signage standards on regional trail networks in various stages of development. Through their work, they've been able to create overarching identities that help trail users know where they are and where they can go on trails in their areas, all while promoting the network as a whole, as an amenity and destination to residents and visitors in their respective regions. We will start on the West Coast with Gary Keck, who will discuss the trail network signage featured along the various trails that make up the intertwine in the Portland, Oregon area. In addition to his work with the Intertwine, Gary is the Design and Development Manager with Tualatin Hills Park and Recreation District in Beaverton, Oregon. Moving east, we'll hear from Melinda Vonstein about her trail network signage focused work as the Central Ohio Greenways Coordinator at the Mid-Ohio Regional Planning Commission in the Columbus, Ohio area. I've spent a good amount of time myself on trails in that area and can personally attest to the quality of the signage and overarching brand that her and her colleagues have established there. Next, we'll jump to Philadelphia, where my RTC colleague Liz Sewell will introduce the Circuit Trail, the developing system in southeastern Pennsylvania and South Jersey, but is also the newest trail network featured in this webinar. The Circuit is one of RTC's eight Trail Nation projects, which you can learn more about on our website, railstotrails.org. And finally, Liz's office mate and RTC project manager, Anya Soretsky, will dive more in depth into the new signage standards developed for the circuit trails in 2016. And barring any technical trouble, Anya and Liz will join me on camera for the duration of the webinar. All four presenters will stick around at the end of the webinar today to answer any questions you may have in the time allotted. In the event we don't have time to answer your question, or if questions come up down the road, you'll find contact information for Gary, Melinda, Liz, Anya, and myself on the final slide of this presentation. Before I turn the mic over to Gary, I need to run quickly through some basic housekeeping. First of all, all of you are muted. You've joined muted and we'll keep you muted. Um, if you have any questions, you can use the chat box on the right-hand side of your screen. We do have my colleague, Anthony Lay, in the room with me to address any tech issues that may emerge on our end. Um, he's unlikely to be able to help with individual tech issues, so I encourage you to write down the links listed on the screen to reach out to go to webinar directly if you have any issues. As I mentioned, we've built in some time for Q&A at the end of today's webinar. Please feel free to type any content-related questions in the questions box that can be expanded on the right-hand side of your screen. And if for whatever reason you lose the webinar connection, please re-click your login link to rejoin at any time. And finally, after today's webinar, you'll receive a follow-up email from us with a survey asking us how we did on today's webinar and a link to the recording. So with that, Gary, I'm going to turn it over to you to start our featured presentation. All right. Well, good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from. I'm over here in Beaverton, Oregon right now. And as Eli mentioned, I'm going to begin. There we go. All right. So as Eli mentioned, I'm going to begin our discussion on trail network signage, and we'll show you how a brand can come to life on a trail. Um, I'm going to be using examples that we've implemented on trails in the Portland, Oregon metropolitan region through the Intertwine, which is our brand for trails, parks, and natural areas. So here's a map of the Portland metro area. Uh, it includes portions of three counties in Oregon and actually one county in Washington as well. Uh, you can see right here is the Columbia River and Washington's to the north of us. We've got the city of Vancouver, which is considered part of the overall metro area. The Intertwine Alliance is a 165-member coalition that is made up of public, private, and nonprofit organizations working to integrate nature and trails in the Portland region. There are 33 different jurisdictions within the intertwine. And as you can see, we have 65 regional trails spanning over 700 miles in the area that are planned to connect our communities, regional parks, and provide recreation. And you can see those with the orange, the orange lines here. Now I'm with the Twelfth and Hills Park and Recreation District, just west of Portland in the black rectangled area. We serve about 250,000 residents 
we're about 50 square miles in all, and we have six regional trails that go through our area and about 36 miles worth. So to implement the brand on a regional trail system, the Intertwined Alliance created regional trails signage guidelines for parks and transportation agencies as they plan, design, and fabricate all the wayfinding signage along regional trails. The creation of the document was led by our regional government here uh, called Metro, and it included stakeholders from over 20 agencies, including our state Department of Transportation. And the process in creating, the, in creating these guidelines was very collaborative. One of the early decisions the group agreed to was that we wanted to put together guidelines. We felt those were more appropriate than standards. And the guidelines are designed to offer flexibility to agencies that already have trail signs in place, while also providing solutions for certain conditions where existing standards may fall a little short. Now, our goal was to improve the public's experience along regional trails by providing consistent and informative signs and to increase awareness of the intertwine um, through the sign's distinctive styles, the color, the use, um, and the use of the intertwine logo, which is basically our brand. The guidelines are intended to be followed when signing off-street regional trails, as well as on-street bicycle and pedestrian facilities that serve as a primary route from connecting one trail to the next, uh, regardless of the jurisdiction you're in. Uh, as I mentioned, we have over 30 jurisdictions that these trails go through, and we see this as similar to the interstate highway system, where all the signs are the same throughout the states. So the Regional Trail Signage Guidelines, it's a 77-page technical document. Uh, it is used when signing new trails, replacing signs, or retrofitting signs along existing trails. Now, the manual itself, it includes an introduction, which describes how to use the guidelines, and it has a section on frequently asked questions to help us um, as providers to get through the manual. The, there's a chapter on sign family, describing the messaging and the content of each type of sign. There's a chapter on sign location planning, and it provides the typical sign placement uh, and the information as well. The design guideline chapter provides the sign color matrix. It shows all the topography and, and the logos and how to implement those. And then finally, there's a chapter on fabrication, which includes information on how to fabricate the signs, uh, as well as details for installation. So as you can see here, we have our directional sign, which is this one right here, the trolley trail. We've got our my, typical mileage marker, We've got a trailhead sign, which you can see here in the middle, which is a fairly big sign. And then the off, the, the on-street signage as well. It's right through here. Within the manual, you'll find guidelines on how to orient the signs, including sign heights, their sizes, and their shapes. Uh, here's an example of an off-street multi-use directional sign right here on the right. And it gives you some scale there with the person. The signs are made of standard materials and mounting methods. The manual also includes several scenarios providing guidance on which sign to use and information on where to place the signs. And this helps to ensure that each jurisdiction within the intertwine uses the wayfinding in a similar format and again, enforcing the visual identity of our brand. Now, to date, we've installed over 500 signs and about 20 miles worth of regional trail throughout the Portland metro area. Uh, the park district that I work for recently installed 126 signs throughout three of our regional trails. District staff created each individual sign, and you gotta imagine every sign is unique and requires a lot of coordination to ensure that the information is accurate and meets the, signs guide, uh, the signage guidelines. You can see that the signs are formatted in a heads up map, which you can see here. And these maps are oriented according to where they're situated, not necessarily north south. So if you're facing south, the top of the map is south and the bottom is north. And, and we tested several options of this and we found that most people preferred this orientation, especially users who weren't familiar with the area. 
And the signs can provide information on upcoming destinations and cross streets, which you can see here on the left. Uh, and it actually gives the distances too, uh, which helps the, the users. And they have the Intertwine and the local agencies logos are consistently at the bottom. You can see here's the Intertwine and here's the Park District's logo. Um, the rules and regulations on some of the signs are put here on the left. And the rules and regulations we leave up to each agency because they do differ, but we have that flexibility. During the installation process, we assigned one of our park rangers to manage the wayfinding signage project. The project also included hiring a contractor. Our park ranger worked closely with them to ensure that the signs were placed in the appropriate location, facing in the correct direction, and met all the manual, manual placement um, guidelines, including the heights and, and sizes and whatnot. And the coordination was extensive, uh, but the manual did provide us with a vision, uh, gave us the guidelines on how to work through the process, and was extremely helpful. The trailhead signs include maps showing the locations in relation to surrounding areas as well. This is one of our trailhead signs, and you can see it's uh, got some streets and other parks that are nearby to give the, the user an idea of where they're at. Creating a sign with the bright color on the top, uh, we found catches your attention, and that's where we put the trail name, which you can see here, the Rock Creek Trail. Uh, it'll, the use of symbols was also incorporated into our signs. Um, the use of symbols allows for a lot of information to be placed in a small space, and it's also more universal for communicating with diverse populations that we have. And with the signs installed, we have noticed that the trail use has increased. Uh, we have trail counters on all of our regional trails. And right now, we've got one trail, uh, Fennel Creek Regional Trail, which gets about 14,000 users a month. And our rangers also noticed that there was a drop in phone calls of asking where the regional trail goes and, and where they're at in the system, which is nice. So having the brand with the standard wayfinding signage has been a success, in our opinion. Uh, it's been very powerful for the intertwine over here in our region. Our regional trail network becomes one, uh, and it's not just chopped up into the 33 different jurisdictions that we have here. So the intertwine is focused on meeting the needs in the, of the growing and changing population, um, including investing in trails and, and natural areas to improve the quality of life in the greater Portland area. Um, we really feel that the signage program we've put together is, is helping with that. So if you have any, if you'd like more information on the Intertwine, I've got the website here. Uh, I've also got a link there that you can see that gets to the regional trails signage guideline that you can find. Uh, with that, uh, thank you for your time. I'm gonna pass it over to Eli. All right, thank you, Gary. I love that you can just look at any of those signs on presumably any trail in the system and know that you're on an intertwined trail. That's that's really cool. I think a lot of that has to do with that bright color. All right. I'm going to toss it over to you now, Melinda. Um, and if you could just confirm that you are able to advance the slides, that would be great. Hi, um, I'm Melinda Vonstein. I am the Central Ohio Greenways Coordinator. Uh, I've been in this role for about uh, one year now. So uh, to begin, I'll just give you guys a little bit of background on what Central Ohio Greenways is and um, how it was formed. So Central Ohio Greenways is a committee within the Mid-Ohio Regional Planning Commission, our local MPO in the Columbus, Ohio region. Um, Central Ohio Greenways was chartered to develop um, an extensive series of trails in the Central Ohio region, and it crosses uh, eight counties. Um, in 2015, the Greenways program formed a board to formalize its efforts, um, although the program was started over 10 years ago. Um, its mission is to increase the access to, for, of trails and increase its usage um, for both transportation and recreational uses. Last year, the Central Ohio Greenways Board developed a trail vision that um, added 
500 additional miles of proposed trail. So on this map, the purple is our existing trails and the orange are the planned trails. Um, so this, these trails cross eight counties and the, the physical trails are fairly diverse. Some are really rural, some are scenic and natural, and some are fairly urban and exist along major roadway corridors. Um, additionally, these trails cross um, a lot of jurisdictions. Um, by last count, the, this network um, extended into over 114 jurisdictions. Um, so as you can imagine, the physical trail experience, as well as the jurisdictional regulations um, that this network reaches, um, can add a lot of complexities to implementing a cohesive wayfinding network. Um, in 2005, the Central Ohio Greenways program um, developed this trail signage guideline that you see here. Uh, it was funded through a collaboration of multiple jurisdictions. Um, it was primarily, and signs were primarily installed by the City of Columbus Rec and Parks and Metro Parks uh, throughout trails that extended into ju their jurisdictions. Uh, throughout the years, though, MORPSI and the COG effort has assisted some of the smaller jurisdictions with um, developing the layout and um, helping decide where the signs should be placed. So this signage has worked pretty well throughout the years, um, but recently um, it has been modified or we started to modify it in a couple of different ways. Um, in 2015, when the Central Ohio Greenways Board was developed, the um, it divided itself up into four different working groups focused on four different things, including marketing, operations and access, partnerships, and trail development. Um, so each one of these groups has kind of influenced the evolution of the, the signage and wayfinding package over the years. The Trail Development Committee has touched on the very technical details of like where the sign is placed along a trail, um, ADA guidelines, and the very technical things like that. The Marketing Committee um, was focused heavily on the logo and the identity of the signage within the, the system. Um, a color was assigned to each trail um, back in 2005. Um, recently, we started to look at these colors again and understand how we can um, use the colors in, ex in expanded ways um, now that we're adding more trails to the network. So becoming increasingly difficult to find a unique color for each one of our trails since we've added so many and plan to add additional trails. So some of the colors are going to represent trail categories instead of just one specific trail. Um, the partnership working group um, in 2017 was really focused on figuring out how we could highlight our partner agencies and partner organizations and really reinforce the brand. So the signage was kind of reimagined to dedicate a larger footprint to partnership identities and the COG identity. Um, and then the end of last year and, and this year, uh, the Operations and Access Committee has kind of evaluated the, the, evalu the evolution of the signage and has realized that signs can't necessarily be everything to everyone. Um, and you know, there's certainly a technical branding and partnership influence on all great signage and wayfinding packages. Um, however, over the course of the next year, the Operations and Access Working Group has really identified um, a need to reprioritize uh, the goal of the signage and focus on wayfinding. So this means in this draft signage, the wayfinding piece of the signage is really the meat of the sign and occupies the most space on the sign. Um, other supplementary information like the logos and partner identities um, frame that wayfinding aspect. Additionally, last year there was an effort to um, implement and really focus on a Blue Ways effort in the Central Ohio region. Since many of our existing trails run along river corridors, there's um, an overlap in blue ways and green ways. Um, 
So we really wanted to make sure that blue ways and green ways could have a similar identity and fit within the same package. Um, additionally, since the trails in central Ohio are really diverse, they're in urban and rural areas, um, we wanted to make sure that the signage package uh, seemed flexible enough to incorporate um, all of these diverse trails and situations. Um, so we have some trails in our network that are actually part of larger regional trails. So the Ohio to Erie Trail runs through the Central Ohio Greenways Network, and there are portions of a trail that have multiple names. So the Alum Creek Trail and the Ohio to Erie Trail have the same name. Um, the signage package allows for um, those two trail names to exist in the same sign. Um, you can easily add some water access information on a sign pole, um, add maps. We also um, really want to focus on making these trails something that's useful for transportation purposes and for commuting. Um, so to do that, we need to make sure that it integrates um, directly with uh, local and neighborhood bike routes. So uh, in Grove City, uh, one of the, the suburbs in the Columbus region, we helped them develop a sign that looked very similar to the trail signage that they could use to direct people to the trails. So that, that really sums up the evolution of the COG signage over the last decade or so. Um, we've had a signage program for a while, and um, I, I guess I, I hope that uh, telling you more about the evolution of the signage program helps give you a sense of some of the complexities, and um, there will be competing interests and a lot of information that should be included on a sign, so it's important to maintain a sense of hierarchy and understand what the hierarchy of a signage package should be when making modifications. All right, thank you, Melinda. Um, I've seen on uh, Anthony's computer over here that we've been receiving some great questions throughout um, both of your presentations. So we will hold for those, we're noting them. Um, we will get to as many as we can at the end of um, today's presentation. Um, but let's head right into the circuit. Um, so Liz and Anya, I've given you keyboard and mouse control, so feel free to take it away. Great, thanks. Can you hear me okay, Eli? Okay. Um, hi, everyone, and thanks, Eli. My name is Liz Sewell, and as Eli said, I am the Trail Development Manager for the Northeast Region of Rails to Trails Conservancy. And here in the Northeast office, um, we're located in Philadelphia, and we also have an office in Camden, New Jersey. Um, but our major focus is the Circuit Trails, which is a trail network in, um, in Philly Metro. So in this presentation, I will introduce the Circuit Trails and the governance of the Circuit Trails, and then my colleague, Anya, will talk about our signage program. So um, the circuit trails are, this is a map of the circuit trails and um, they are, they lie in both Pennsylvania and New Jersey and they are an interconnected network of 800 miles of trails. Um, and they take people from where they live to where they want to be as the former um, trail networks that you just heard from do as well. Um, Pennsylvania and New Jersey are very di uh, different states with unique sets of highlights and challenges. Um, Pennsylvania's uh, circuit trails are a bit more developed um, based on advanced funding and policy in the state. Um, and in New Jersey, Rails to Trails is really working. New Jersey is great too, um, but we are working to uh, build policy that allows the uh, active transportation network to achieve the goals and vision that the circuit and Rails to Trails Conservancy has for the state. Um, so this is, this slide just shows the current status of the circuit trails. Um, there are, as you can see, more than 800 miles of trails and 
over, there's now over 325 miles of completed uh, trails in Pennsylvania and New Jersey. Next slide. Um, and just a brief background on the governance of the circuit trails. So Rails to Trails sits on the steering committee for the circuit trails. And um, there are 12 other organizations on the steering committee. Um, and we meet monthly to talk about our strategic goals, our vision, and the progress on the trails and um, policy issues that may have come up. We also have a broader coalition that consists of over 65 organizations and agencies um, that meets twice a year and uh, assists us on our, our vision and our strategy um, and meets to come uh, to hear the status updates, basically. So um, I think that is about all. Uh, so a few years ago, we realized the need for unified branding and signage across the circuit. So Anya has, my colleague Anya has taken that on um, and I will let her speak next. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. Okay, so one of the things the Circuit Coalition had been doing um, is a very robust marketing and communications strategy. So we have um, earned media, owned media, shared media. We go um, to events across the circuit. We give out swag. We have our signage, uh, our pop-up signage that you can see in the picture there. So the, the brand of the circuit is being distributed across a lot of channels. You can see we have um, a bus there. We've had billboards, um, digital ads. We're on social media, all of that, but we realize that when a trail user is out on their morning jog, on a circuit trail, they might not realize that they're on a circuit trail because the signage is just for that specific trail. Um, so that's how we decided we really need to, to do a circuit um, signage program. So the goals of that program are to expand the visibility of the circuit, to unify the circuit trails, and educate local users about what the circuit is. Next slide, please. So in 2016, that's when we decided to do all of this during our strategic planning process. So that started um, a three round process. The first round was researching signs, designing um, the various types of signs, testing those signs out. The second round was uh, a wider rollout. And then the third round is what we are in currently, and that's an ongoing program. So I'll go into all of those rounds in more detail. But first, I want to show you our signage template. Um, thank you. So the first of all, this is a voluntary program. So we wanted to make it um, very flexible, have a, a lot of different options based on the feedback that we heard from uh, our trail managers. So the first option is a blade sign. So this, the language is a proud segment of the circuit trail. So this is a sign that can go up on a trail and you immediately understand the connection um, from this local trail to the, the larger network. The next set are our trail affiliation signs. So this has a place where you can put the actual name of the trail there. Um, specifically calling out that it's part of the circuit. And below you have the option to show the logo of the trail manager and other partners that are on the ground working on this trail. And that's optional. So you can see the one um, on the right doesn't have that. The next option is the circuit connection sign. So this is a wayfinding sign. So for some um, trails, they didn't have any wayfinding at all, so this was something that was important to a certain subset of trail managers on the circuit. Um, and then the last option is the trail medallion. This was a great option for trail managers that were concerned about signage pollution if they already had a lot of signs out on their trails. This is a three inch or a five inch medallion that you can attach to pre-existing posts on a trail kiosk um, 
it's smaller, but it still does get that logo out there. Okay, so the first round of signage, we initially interviewed members of the coalition. We wanted to see if this was something that managers would be open to um, because the, the circuit is a voluntary program. In general, people opt into the circuit and they have their own brand identities on the ground for specific trails. So we did find that managers were open to this. Um, this was also an opportunity to hear what kinds of signs they wanted. So that's how the, the um, options that I just showed you came about. We also researched best practices from across the country to see what was being done elsewhere in terms of design, materials, installation, et cetera. So once we created the templates, we asked for feedback from the coalition. Um, we also worked with three different manufacturers and had samples of signs actually manufactured. So that was great to see who we wanted to work with long term. Um, also, it was interesting to see the big range of prices and materials. So the materials really made a big difference um, in terms of price. Then we went ahead and had 50 signs manufactured and six trails were our initial testers for those. And then we solicited feedback from those trail managers. So the next round, we um, installed 100 signs at no cost. Again, all of this was at no cost. This was funded through the William Penn Foundation. So they are our major supporter of circuit initiatives generally. Um, and then this round, we did ask the trail managers to cover hardware. Um, if there were new posts that needed to be purchased, we asked them to cover that, um, as well as installation. And installation in the first round, also, we asked the trail managers to cover. And that wasn't um, a big issue for trail managers because they do have um, staff that is working on maintenance generally. So here is a map of these circuit trails and where signs are currently. The red dots are the signs. So we have 150 signs installed, which we're very happy about. Um, and there's more coming every day, pretty much. And if you are familiar with any of the trails in the circuit footprint, you can take a look at the list of trails that opted into this program so far. And finally, I'll talk about where we are currently. Um, you can advance to the next slide. So our goal now is to have signage on every trail in the circuit, and that's existing trails as well as trails that are coming online, being constructed now and in the future. So a really exciting um, breakthrough that we have is that there is funding for signage through our regional trails program. This is a dedicated source of funding for the circuit trails um, in terms of design, construction, um, engineering. So anyone who is applying to our municipal planning organization, which is DVRPC, anyone who's applying will, um, they'll be notified that they do need to include a plan for signage uh, for those funds. So if you receive construction dollars, you'll need to show that you plan on installing signage. Um, so that is great because that source of funding is ongoing and we'll make sure that signage is something that we don't have to ask for funding for as a separate program. Um, the other option for trails that are already constructed is to use funds in the individual organization's budget. And we do encourage people to do this and to think about this. It really isn't very expensive. The medallions are $10. And then the most expensive sign is the wayfinding sign, and that's about $175 per sign. So it is an expense, but we think it's definitely worth it and you know, not outrageously expensive. And so with this final round, we're shifting responsibility to the trail manager to conduct this signage process. Um, for the initial rounds, we at Rails to Trails Conservancy were going through the entire process, um, working with the trail manager to get the information that they wanted on their wayfinding, 
for example, and then submitting those orders to the manufacturer. Now we're asking the trail manager to do that. And so here is um, a breakdown of what that process looks like. So a trail manager needs to identify their funding. They need to pick their signage type and the location, order proofs from the manufacturer, submit the order, get the signs, install them. And then the one thing that Rails to Trails Conservancy is asking everyone to do is to photograph those signs and report their GPS coordinates. And that way we will know where all the signs are. Um, and so that map that I showed you earlier will continue to be updated so we can really see how much coverage we have. So all in all, we're really happy with where we are with circuit signage now. It's something that we were unsure of if trail managers would be okay adding that extra layer of branding to their signs, especially when they already had um, their own branding and their own signage installed. Um, so we're really happy that everyone has been so on board with this process because it does make a big difference um, to trail users to know that their trail is part of the larger circuit network. Thank you. Liz and Anya. Um, it looks like we have about 20 minutes or so, maybe 15 for questions, and we have been receiving a ton of them. So let me um, start off with one I saw a while ago when uh, Gary was presenting, and I'll pose that to you, Gary, first, but I think it applies to all of you. So we can uh, open up the uh, floor after Gary takes the first stab. So, and that question is from Jim Ridge, and essentially he noted that you mentioned that um, 30 jurisdictions were involved in the intertwine, um, and he was interested in how you got buy-in from all of them. So what made them want to participate in this? What would um, encourage them to maintain their participation? But the intertwine, but the intertwine it's, it's, a, it's coalition a coalition that, that we put, put together years together ago, years and it's ago. led by our local regional government, Metro, and you know the the buy-in is metro's goal is to, to increase the use of the trails and protecting our natural areas and connecting our parks to make our region more livable so um, for our agency it was is a natural fit because as a park and recreation agency that's you know we're all here to, to make our communities more livable and and get people out and recreating um the Early on, I guess, what we looked at was getting the group put together. I, just, I guess it wasn't that hard to answer the question. Uh, people wanted to be involved. They wanted to collaborate and make sure that um, we were all on the same page with, with our trail signage. And everybody participating was able to put their input in there, and Metro led the, the coalition for, with the signage guidelines. And it, it went fairly smooth from what I can recall. Does anybody else have any input on their areas and getting agencies to collaborate? Yeah, so for us, um, it did take a lot of outreach to explain the signage program to trail managers. Not everyone was interested in participating or able to participate. In some cases, there was too much red tape. Um, but our managers do see a value in being part of the circuit trails. So they understood that having that visible affiliation was really important. Um, and the circuit really does offer a lot of opportunities in general to our trail managers in terms of funding, in terms of visibility, advertising, all of that. So. I think people just generally understood it was a great opportunity to, to be affiliated. Yeah, I think similarly, uh, Central Ohio Greenways, you know, it crosses 114 ju different jurisdictions. So really for these trails to be useful, the jurisdictions need to work together. And it's important there's, that there's a cohesive signage and wayfinding system. Um, so I, I think generally it's pretty easy to get buy-in from our member jurisdictions. Um, I, I think since we are dealing with 
um, jurisdictions of varying sizes, townships and villages and cities who have varying levels of resources, I think it's important to really understand and talk to each of our, our partners about maybe what some of the barriers are that are preventing them from being able to install um, wayfinding signage. So in some smaller communities, um, it could just be that they don't have the resources to um, create the signage layouts. So if um, COG can assist in that way, they may have the ability to install um, the signs. So. Great, thank you all. Um, and we have a good question here from Betsy Anderson, since I, I don't recall any of you touching on it, but I know that it was um, a part of probably at all, all three of your systems. Um, and she asks if you could discuss the types of public engagement that were conducted uh, for each signage project to ensure that the trails feel as welcoming as possible to diverse communities. So we didn't necessarily work with the public to develop the signage program, but we did ask for input from the coalition as a whole, so that's 65 different organizations that do represent their local constituencies. Um, so we hope that that was somewhat reflective of what the, those constituencies were looking for in a signage program. Yeah, and this is Gary. and. I'll be quite honest, ours was put together back in 2012. Uh, I wasn't directly involved with it at that time, but um, same, same situation with us. We did have a, a steering committee put together with all the different jurisdictions, so they had their um, ability to put input in on the design. And they did do, you know, the, the guidance plan does talk about doing some survey groups to test out different types of signs. So that tells me that there was um, interaction with the public to see what they wanted and what was going to work and not work for the for the intertwine. Yeah, and I think that Central Ohio Greenway's process is likely the same. Um, the, the original signage package was developed in 2005, so I'm not quite sure what what or if the, the public involvement looked like there, but it was likely very similar to the circuit where um, we reached out to each of the different agencies and jurisdictions um, and hoped that they were able to represent the, the communities that they um, work with. Great, thank you. Uh, we have a more technical question from Joan Watkowitz, and again, this is for all of you. Um, and she's interested in your ideas about materials to use for your signage. Um, for materials, I think it's really important when we're working with lots of, of different um, different communities um, that have different resources that, that whatever material is chosen for the sign face can be applied to many different sign poles. So a lot of communities have a signage, a standard for a type of pole that they'll use for um, street signage or wayfinding signage. So I, I think it's just key that they can continue to use the pole and the face is flexible enough. So we are using... Here, go ahead. Oh, thank you. Um, so we're using aluminum, um, just the standard signs that are used on um, for streets for stop signs we did test out some more modern high-tech materials um, but they were a lot more expensive and for us we were really in a pilot program so we were thinking you know these might not be the signs that we want to have 10 or 20 years down the road um, so those more high-tech materials if you're looking for something that is more durable, you could go with those, but it really just depends on um, how much money you wanna to commit to an individual sign. With the, the intertwine with our guide and guidelines, we're using aluminum signs as well um, that are printed on and then we put a, a UV laminate over it 
Um, but there's that flexibility in there for agencies to take a look at what they've been using in their system already, but we're typically using the two inch, you know, square posts or metal posts for the signs, like a typical road sign. Um, but there is that flexibility of using um, pressure treated posts if, if you need to, um, depending on where it is. So we've got a couple of different options in our guidelines you can take a look at. Excellent, thank you all. Um, uh, so we have quite a few questions on signage costs. And Anya, you mentioned going through um, the process with a bunch of different vendors and a wide range of quotes. So maybe you'd like to, to take a stab at answering the question first and then everybody else can uh, chime in. But essentially it's um, what was the range of signage costs? What did it look like? And um, how much are you currently paying roughly uh, for your signs? Yeah, so I would definitely recommend getting a number of quotes. The first manufacturer that we went to, we thought, oh, that must be about average. And it was really not. It was maybe three times as expensive as the, the cost that we we're going with now. Um, we're working with a manufacturer that does municipal signage. So I think their, their costs are pretty affordable. Um, the small medallions are $10 per sign, and then the larger wayfinding signs are about $175. Um, one of the things to keep in mind that changes the price is the design work. So the signs that we have that are just a, a set sign or just as a proud segment of the circuit trails, that's a set cost. I think those are about $50. But then when you start changing the language, the name of the trail, um, the logos, you do, if you don't have a design department, you have to pay um, a graphic designer or the sign manufacturer to, to change those files. So there is a cost associated with that as well. For the, the intertwine, well, for the park district here, Twelton Hills Park and Rec, we've been going through the, the local state corrections program. They have a, a work-based program, a sign shop down there that um, has saved us some money. Uh, but sign, the similar costs, um, back in 2013 or 14, those 126 signs we put up included design, uh, materials, and installs, $70,000 for all 126 signs through three different regional trails. So that doesn't give you much detail in sign itself, but um, on a bigger project, that's what we spent a few years ago. All right, um, and uh, here's a great question from Mark Wilkinson. Um, and this goes out to all of you again, but I think um, it might be good to start with Melinda because she mentioned the Ohio to Erie Trail. Mark asks if you have a way to mark or sign a situation where two or three trails share the same footprint. For instance, if a trail is part of a national trail and with a local trail name. Yeah, so we have that situation quite a bit with uh, Central Ohio Greenways. There may be a local trail name, a regional trail name, statewide trail name, or even a, a national trail name that all coincide in one location. Um, so the the signage that we are looking at um, lists, th there's a space that we can list all of those trail names on the signage. Um, in the past, uh, the Ohio to Erie trail logo has kind of just been stuck on some of the um, trail signage, um, but yet that's definitely something that can be confusing because um, our trail users don't always know that there are multiple trail names or it can get very confusing if it's not, if all the trail names aren't listed on the sign. Gary, Anya, or Liz, have you run into that? Uh, yes, so one of the solutions we have um, is the affiliation sign where it has the logos at the bottom so that, for example, you could put, we have the East Coast Greenway as part of the circuit. So there's local, there's the local trail name that goes at the top and then at the bottom, we can put the East Coast Greenway logo. Um, another, situation we have is with the, um, 
the DNL Canal Trail. So that one, they have a very consistent brand identity, a lot of signage, um, and they have, I'm not sure what the, the term for that is, but they're kind of these flat metal posts that serve as their signage. So we were actually able to put one of the medallions onto their existing sign. So we're so the DNL's logo is the, the main logo and the name of the trail is, is more present. And then below that, we have the circuit. So in the intertwine, our guidelines give us, again, the flexibility for a situation like this. Um, within the park district, we don't have that situation right now. We do have a few within the region where one trail might turn into a different trail. And at those intersections where they um, change names, we do have signage and some protocol on how to do that. Um, so it, it's in the manual. You can just follow the, the, the process through it. All right. Um, and here's a good question um, from Ursula Sandstrom with uh, the Washington Area Bicyclist Association. Uh, she wants to know if um, any of your networks have integrated maintenance reporting communication to users into the uh, signage. So with the, the intertwined, we, I, I guess I don't know exactly what she's asking, but we do have the logos of each jurisdiction on the sign so you know where you are. Um, and on the trailheads, there are uh, information and phone numbers to call with that segment. Does that answer it, you think? I think I think that's probably, uh, yep, yeah, yeah, she says yes, that's what she's getting at. Um, yeah. Anya, Lisa, Melinda? Yeah, we have something similar where we have the partner logos or the agency responsible for maintaining the trail on the signage. Like their phone number or logo will be on it. Yeah, that's pretty much what we have. Um, some of the trail managers, their specific signs outside of the circuit have more specific information, but for the circuit as a whole, we don't have anything like that besides listing the logos in some cases. All right. Um, and I think we can do one final question uh, before I have to wrap up. Um, and this one's from Jack Kozla. Um, and he wants to know what level of government approvals were obtained, so town level, county, state, um, for your vari uh, various signage. Um, and I guess, how did you go about securing that approval? Um, and it'd be great to get an answer from all of you. Let's move east to west. So Anya and Liz. So it depended on who the trail manager was. Um, if it was the municipality, a lot of times they had to go outside of the, the parks department to get that approval. Um, and so in some cases it took a while, but yeah, it was really a, a case by case basis. All right, Melinda. Yeah, for COG signage, um, since it's really a, a voluntary guideline, um, the sent the Middle Ohio Regional Planning Commission and the Central Ohio Greenways Board adopted this guideline, um, but it's really a voluntary um, program and local governments can decide whether or not they want to follow the guideline or not. So and with the, the intertwine, we had that working group that I mentioned earlier with you know 30 some jurisdictions um, and everybody had input I think the for most of us trail builders, you know, with, depends on if you're in the right of way or out of the right of way. So when you're in the right of way, you've got all the city and county and potentially state jurisdictions codes that, um, you know, hopefully all match. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. But on our steering committee, we had each of those agencies um, there and available. Um, one of the things we found was to meet some of those guidelines and standards from the state, the, um, the on-street signage took a little different look than the off-street, uh, which is fine. And then also the signs on the off-street, what we noticed to meet some of those requirements, um, like ADA even, you look at some of the federal standards for you know text heights and whatnot, 
the signs did become a little bigger than we had anticipated um, originally. So we took all that in cons consideration when we did the guidelines and uh, we got buy-in from each of the agencies within the in intertwine um, along the way. So. All right. Uh, thanks to all of you and thanks to all of our attendees, uh, especially for bearing with us as we dealt with that brief tech issue. It looks like most of you stayed on, which I appreciate you're all dedicated. Um, so in front of you, you'll see names, titles, affiliations, and contact information for all of our presenters as well as myself. Feel free to email any um, unanswered questions directly to them um, or email them to me and I'll, I'll make sure they reach the right person. We'll also work on a process for answering any of the questions we didn't get to live on air. There were actually quite a few of them. So uh, we will be working on that. Um, and again, you'll be receiving a follow-up survey in um, an email that'll be sent tomorrow um, directly from GoToWebinar. Uh, and we really appreciate it if you fill that out as it helps inform future webinar topics. And um, I do want to call your attention to our next webinar, which is on the 2019 opening day for trails. Um, that's on February. The webinar is on February 28th at 3.30 p.m. Eastern. Um, join to learn what to expect, tips for hosting an event, and how you, we can support you along the way. And if you don't know what opening day for trails is, you can head to railstotrails.org slash opening day. Um, we are also working on the final details for a March webinar with the topic uh, likely to be set in stone very soon, and we'll start uh, advertising that probably next week. So stay subscribed to the Trail Expert Network um, and we'll make sure you stay in the know on these webinars. Um, thanks again for attending. Thank you very, very much to all of our panelists. You guys have done great work and I really appreciate your time. All right, until next time. <laughs>